so glad you're here. My name is Brooke, and here's what's happening at Low Country Community Church. If today is your first visit, thanks for coming. We're here for you. We have many ministries to help you connect and grow no matter where you are on life's journey. Take a moment now to complete the connection card in your worship folder and tell us how we can best link with you and your family. Bring your connection card to the hub in the lobby and receive a special welcome packet from Pastor Jeff. Also, use your connection card to tell us about any prayer requests you may have or changes to your contact information. Thank you for choosing Low Country Community Church. LCC has developed unique and age-appropriate environments for your children and students aged six weeks through high school. Take time to become familiar with everything we have to offer your family by asking questions, attending a Connect class, an open house, or visiting our website, lowcountrycc.org. LCC welcomes the use of technology during our services. While you're here, feel free to jump online and read the Bible, follow our notes on uversion.com, check in on Facebook, or any social media. And if you hear something worth repeating, be sure to tweet it. Today is Father's Day, and we want to give a shout out to all you dads and say thanks for all you do. We'd love for you to join us on our next LCC mission team headed to the Atlanta Dream Center July 19th to the 21st. We will be working with the Dream Center on a few of their ongoing inner city projects, which are always rewarding, always fun, and perhaps your best opportunity to jump into missions here at LCC. This trip is for young adults and adults young at heart. For more information, visit lccreach.com. We've designed today's service with you in mind as a total package. As a courtesy to others, please don't leave the worship center during the service or before the last song is over. You never know what God is saying to the person next to you, and your early departure disrupts the service. If you must step out, please think about remaining in the lobby and viewing the remainder of the service from there. Thank you for being a good neighbor. Thanks for watching today. You can always stay up to date with the latest at LCC by visiting our website, lowcountrycc.org, or connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to seeing you there.
not ashamed, and that's what we're here to do, is unashamedly sing about our God. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? Awesome. Welcome to LCC. Happy Father's Day. It's awesome to have you with us. My name is Eric. It's great to have all of you folks here with us today. If you're new with us, if this is your first time, we'd love you to fill out a connection card in your worship folder and turn that in at the hub so we can get to know you better. So if you could do that, it's a personal favor to us. That'd be great. Why don't you say hello to somebody? Tell them you're glad they're here, and we're going to keep singing together.
shout of worship. You guys have a seat. Good morning, Low Country. I'm Casey, and I'm the volunteer cafe manager here at LCC. We're going to receive our offering in just a moment. Don't forget, you can give online by going to lowcountrycc.org and clicking on the giving link. As we prepare today, we'd like to wish all of our dads a happy Father's Day. There's my dad. He's in here somewhere. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Um, we also want to thank our Heavenly Father for all that he has done for us. It's through his example of wisdom and love and generosity that we've learned how to endure through both the good and the bad. As you give today, let's not do it as a chore or because we feel like it's expected of us, but let's do it just out of gratefulness and just as a big thank you for all that's been provided for us. And let's have fun while we do it. There's no reason not to. And dads, remember, show your children the way they should go. And when they are old, they will never depart from it. Bow your heads as we pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for all that you've done for us so far and just how much you've provided for us and the example you've set. Thank you for being the ultimate father and for giving us this unconditional love that we know we can trust in and we know that we can trust in you. Thank you for guiding us in the way we should go and showing us how we should live. I just pray that we always look towards you and find hope and love in your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship and give.
praise, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Yes, you guys have a seat. Lord God, as I pray for my little girl, I ask that you give her wisdom for the life ahead of her, that she works hard because she works for you, that she speaks truth and love into others and does not use her words to hurt. I ask that she wants to stay pure for the man you have for her, that you will give her courage to stand up against her fears, to be bold for you. Let her understand that life is awesome and that through you, there is uncontrollable joy. Lord, you have given her so much. May contentment fill her life. May she have a heart of integrity and when temptation is staring her in the face, she will turn and do the right thing, even when no one is watching. Give her a drive to share this wisdom with her kids and give her self-control in those times that seem uncontrollable. Lord, let this wisdom recklessly fill her life and let it fill mine. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Feliz Dia del Padre. So welcome, so glad that you are here. Today is Father's Day, and the Father's Day Council tells us that 80 million pounds of beef will be consumed, grilled, barbecued, and blackened today. And all the men said, just something caveman, prehistoric ought to come out of you right now. There are about 100 million Father's Day cards that have been sent this weekend, And according to the Almanac for Farmers and City Folk, the largest day or the the largest number of collect phone calls will occur today on Father's Day. So I don't know what that says, dads, about us, but I want to take a few minutes with you this morning as we continue on through this series in Proverbs called Get Smart, where we are seeking to gain wisdom from the book of Proverbs. We're choosing a number of the themes of Proverbs and taking a look at each one throughout this summer, and today it has to do with child raising, and that's appropriate since it's Father's Day, but there's always a certain amount of hesitation whenever uh, a pastor speaks on the subject of child raising, for me anyway, because uh, mine are still in process. Um, You're never quite finished, are you, with raising your children? I mean, my parents are still waiting to see how I turn out, and I'm 51, so... um, you don't know how your kids are going to turn out. You want them to turn out well, but I, I don't know if there's a certain age that you reach as a dad or as a mom where you know that your parent, your uh, children have turned out, um, but I, I haven't reached that age yet. I've been thinking this week about so many people, some of whom are friends of mine, pastors in ministry, and many of you perhaps here today, and you've got sorrow in your heart today because Maybe your child, or maybe you have children who are not walking with the Lord as you would want them to. And um, we just live in a, in a day and a generation where uh, there are so many things, so many ensnarements, so many entrapments, so many things that can waylay our kids. And I know it's sort of popular to say, well, our kids today have it harder than the preceding generations, but I think there's an element of truth to that. The, the pressures from our culture are are great. The the traps and the snares seeking to capture them are great. The media is against them. Social media is against them. I mean, I've never, growing up, never, ever could have imagined uh, what a cell phone could do, what a computer could do like, like that. That was the stuff that we saw on the Jetsons. Some of you are too young to even know who the Jetsons are. You can Google them. Um, but I, I never could think past a fax machine. I'm, I'm still amazed by a fax. And for some of you, again, Google it. Um, but dads, I want to talk to you today a little bit. But also, overall, I think, uh, talk to those of you who are parents, who are grandparents, uh, who have uh, the opportunity and the blessing to impact the lives of children. Talk to you a little bit today. Dads, it's our job to guide them on the right way. Do they always listen? No but it's still our job to guide them. Irma Bombeck was perhaps one of America's most popular authors in the 70s and 80s, and actually still is. She passed away some years ago, but her books still continue to sell. 
in the thousands. And if you're a, uh, a parent, a mom especially, if you've never read Irma Bombeck, I would highly recommend picking up some of her books. She was an author. She wrote newspaper columns and such. And she said one day, I received a letter from a, a lady. She was a single mom. And she had raised her son. Her son was married, and her son was about to become a father. And she wrote to Irma, Burbeck, Irma Bombeck, and she said, he had no recollection of his father. What can I tell him a father does? And Irma said, that caused me to reflect on my own childhood. Her dad died when she was nine years old. She was raised by her mom, single mom type of a thing. And she said, it got me to thinking, what does a dad do? And so she wrote about what a dad does. And if you'll allow me to, I'd like to read to you what Irma Bombeck said. She said, as far as I could observe, dads brought around the car when it rained so everyone could stay dry. They always took the family pictures. That's why they were never in them. They carved turkeys on Thanksgiving, kept the car gassed up. They were never afraid to go into the basement, mow the lawn, and tighten the clothesline to keep it from sagging. Again, for some of you, clothesline Google it. You'll, you'll see pictures. Um, and then Irma writes this, it wasn't until my husband and I had children that I was able to observe firsthand what a father contributed to a child's life. What did he do to deserve their respect? As I watched my husband be a father, she said, I observed he rarely fed them. He never did anything about sagging diapers. He didn't wipe their noses or their bottoms. All I could tell was he played ball with them and tried to bond with them under the hood of a car. What did he do? And she said, well, he threw them higher than his head until they were weak from laughter. He cast the deciding vote in the great puppy debate. He listened more than he talked. He let them make mistakes. He allowed them to fall from their first two-wheeler without having a heart attack. He read a newspaper while they practiced parallel parking in preparation for their driving test. And she said, if I had to tell someone's son what a father really does that is important, it would be that he shows up for the job in good times and bad times. He's a man who's constantly being observed by his children. They learn from him how to handle adversity and anger and disappointment and success. He won't laugh at their dreams no matter how impossible they might seem. He will go out at one in the morning because they've run out of gas he will make unpopular decisions and stand by them. When he's wrong and makes a mistake, he will admit it. He sets the tone for how family members treat one another and how you learn to treat members of the opposite sex and people who are different than they are. By example, he can instill a desire to give something back to the community when its needs are greater than their own families. But mostly, a good father involves himself in his kids' lives. The more responsibility he has for a child, the harder it is to walk out of their lives. A father has the potential to be a powerful force in the life of a child. And she says, Dad, maybe you'll get a greeting card for your efforts, maybe not, but it's steady work. Dads, we have the opportunity, the blessing, the privilege to pour into our children's lives. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Based out of one verse in Proverbs, chapter 22 and verse 6. It's a verse that is fairly well known to a lot of people. It simply says, train up in a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or he will not turn from it. I want to take a look today at what God's Word says about parenting. This applies to dads, it applies to moms, it applies to any of us that have the opportunity to pour into a child's life. I've heard dozens of Father's Day sermons. I've given dozens of Father's Day sermons. This is the 14th one I've given. Um, I didn't mention this before and I haven't thought much about it, but today, um, today is my 14th anniversary. I started Father's Day 1999. So thanks for letting me give 14 Father's Day messages. I appreciate that. And I didn't say that so that you would applaud, but you could have done better. I'm just saying. No, I'm only kidding. Oh, it's been great. And what I so often fear whenever I've gone to church, so many Father's Day messages, I think maybe purposefully, maybe not, do a pretty good job about heaping guilt 
dad, on what you're not doing, and you need to do better. I don't want to do that. We get enough guilt from everywhere else in the world. We don't need it at church. I want to encourage you today. I want to honor you today. And most of all, I just want to take a few moments with you and teach you what this one verse says about how you can be a good dad. Is that a deal? Let's do it. Open your Bibles to Proverbs 22.6, or if you're watching or reading it on your phone or whatever, turn it on there. And let me begin by just making two simple observations about children. We'll pray, and then we're going to dissect this verse. Here's the first observation. If you're following along in here or in the cafe uh, on your outline there, first observation, and again, they're simple, but when it comes to raising children, each one is unique. I'll never forget the epiphany I had the day I realized child number two was different than child number one. I was a young father and just assumed that child number two would be exactly like child number one. I know that sounds stupid now, but I, that's what I believe. And then when child number three acted differently than child number two and child number one, and by the way, we name them. We don't call them child one, two, you know, <laughs> thing one, thing two, and thing three. They actually have names. And, uh, but man, they're different. They, they, they're unique. Each one's unique. One, one child is very gregarious. The other might be very shy, not as outgoing. One can stand up and speak in front of hundreds of people in public. The other one, no way. I mean, you will have to drag me up there, and then even then, nothing's going to come out of my mouth. One might be very musically gifted. The other may be uh, very gifted mechanically with their hands or something. You'll learn very quickly that there aren't many hard and fast rules when it comes to applying different things to children because they're so unique. And that leads us into the second observation, that what you do to raise your children is going to vary. It's going to change because as your children grow up, they change. And as they change, they go through phases. And as they go through phases, your parenting skills as a dad or as a mom are going to be challenged. You have to tweak and change a little bit. Gary and Anne Marie Ezzo talk about the four phases of raising your children, and I, I think these are good, so good, and I just want them to share them with you. They're, they're not hard and fast, they're general, but my experience is that they're pretty true. And the first phase is the phase of discipline, and that happens between ages one, zero, like from birth, to about five years old, give or take. This is when you establish, you love your children, you care for your children. That child, when he thinks of daddy or when she thinks of dad or mom or whatever, knows I'm loved, I'm cared for, I'm unconditionally loved. If you do nothing else and instill that in your child in those first five years, you've done a great deal. But you'd better instill a few more things. And that's why it's called the discipline phase. Because what you had better instill in them from zero to five is that I'm in charge that I'm the parent and you're the child. That's not very popular today, and I see a lot of families, they don't function like this. I'm just telling you, if you don't instill in them some discipline in the first five years, the next 15 years are going to be really, really difficult, not only for you, but for them. You're going to have trouble. This is what time you go to bed I know as a four-year-old, you think you know what's best for you and you want to go to bed then. I'm telling you, this is when you go to bed. I'll tell you when you're finished all your vegetables. And some parents recoil at this. Oh, no, we're just going to let them. Okay, fine. But I'm telling you, 10 years from now, you're in big trouble. You establish yourself as the parent. And don't confuse that with letting them run the household. There are so many households surrounding us today that people this tall rule the roost. No. No, dad, mom, you set the standard. You be in charge. And the sooner they understand that, the better off it's going to be for everybody. Second phase, ages 6 to 12. Again, give or take but 6 to 12, and that phase is training. And I use a sports analogy here with a trainer and an, and an athlete. A trainer of an athlete works with that athlete each day in different settings, using different exercises, different drills, getting the children ready to play the game of life. With an athlete, I'm doing these exercises and these drills with you, says the trainer. 
so that you can score the goal, you can make the throw, you can hit the ball, you can uh, win the race, or whatever, whatever it is. And so I'm getting you ready for the game, because when you get there, the, the coaching, the training takes on a different deal. Are you with me? So in ages 6 to 12, I'm training you. Here's what it sounds like. Okay, as you grow up, son, as you grow up to your daughter, you're going to face certain situations. You will run into people who will say unkind things to you. You will run into people who will lie to you. People will hurt you. Here's how you respond. Here's what you say. Here's what you do. I'm training them so that when these things happen, they're ready. When you leave the nest, and sometimes leaving the nest is not when they're married. They leave the nest in a sense when they go off to school. They leave the nest a little bit as they age. Now, they're still there with you, but you don't have all the input on them that you wish you had or that you once had. Does that make sense? And so you pour into them during this training time, 6 to 12. Here's how you respond. Here's what you say. Here's how you act. Because when you get to phase three, it really changes. Phase three is ages 13 to 19. Again, give or take a little bit of time there. This is the coaching phase. Now the children, and many parents refuse to admit this, now the children at this age are in the game of life. They've entered junior high school, high school, starting into college. The game of life has begun, and you're coaching from the sidelines. You can still send in plays, and you can still help them during the timeouts, but you can no longer stop the game and show them how it's to be played. Now they're beginning to call their own plays, and they're moving forward on their own. And this is tough. This is the phase where, at certain seasons, they cease to be human beings. This is the phase where you think, are you even from my own species? This is a phase that my favorite, one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, talked about. And you may have heard me say this before. He said, at age 13, you put your child in a big pickle barrel. It's very big. And you seal it up. And you feed them through a knot hole. And he said, when they turn 18, you plug up the knot hole. That's good parenting advice. This is the phase where they roll their eyes at you. This is the phase where you as their parent become the dumbest person on the planet. This is the phase when they're in their, mind, their minds, you know nothing. This is the phase where they won't walk with you in public. They'll walk ahead of you. Now, they need your, you know, they need your ability to drive, but they're not going to walk with you. Some of you understand this phase, don't you? I see a lot of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're coaching now. You're coaching. You coach a little more when they're younger but you coach a little less, but no less importantly as they age. But you're coaching. You can't stop the game anymore. The game's already being played. That's why phases one and two are so important. Because in phase three, they have dozens and dozens and dozens of other voices speaking into their head and their heart. They're listening to other voices. They're hearing other worldviews and other philosophies of life. They're seeing how other people live. They go into other homes that you really wouldn't want them to necessarily go into, and they see family dynamics that aren't healthy, and they begin to question. And that's all good for them to question, but make sure you keep coaching them through this because they're looking to you for answers. Now, I know they won't admit that they're looking to you for answers, but they're listening more than you think they are. Phase four is the phase that Darlene and I find ourselves in now, and it's the friendship phase. Some of you in phase three right now can't even imagine the friendship phase. You'll get there. But your children have become adults. This summer, ours will be 28, 26, and 20. And you parent differently. You parent just as much, but it's different. And you enter into a difference in your relationship where... And it really is a delight and a joy to be friends with your children. We love hanging out with our children. And so far, they still come and hang out with us. 
We still go on family vacations. They'll always call, you know, starts it around Christmas time when everybody's together. Where are we going next summer? What's the family vacation going to be? Now, I think part of it has to do with the fact that I pay for all of it. I think that has a great deal to do with it. We're all going to Disney in September. I can hardly wait. I have already worked it out. The grandson will be four months old then. I'm going to stay back with the baby. I'm staying back with the baby. You're not getting me in the park. I said, don't you want to see Callie? Don't have all. I said, you got a video thing on the phone? Video it. Send it to me. Kate and I will watch it. We'll be so thrilled to see it. I'm staying back. That's what I get to do. I'm the granddad. And if the other granddad, it's too late. I'm staying back, not him. It's a good phase. It's a good phase. And watching my daughter parent her two now, I'm getting a little payback. But what a blessing the grandkids are. And now I've got an opportunity to parent them, again, in a different way, but as a grandparent. That primarily involves me spoiling them completely rotten, but I'm enjoying it. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. A scripture verse known by many, many, many Christians, and a scripture verse that's believed by many, many Christians, but we really only believe the first part. Because when the second part doesn't come to fruition in our lives, we have a tendency not to believe it. I trained them up in the way that they should go, and they've gotten older, but you know what? They have departed from it. And I don't know if this verse is true. There's there's a word for you in this. I want to break this down with you quickly. Dad, mom, grandparents, show you what this verse means in three parts. Let's, Let's dive in. Do we pray? Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can come to you and you give us wisdom. And Holy Spirit, we learn from Jesus that one of your roles is to teach us. And so that's our prayer, that right now you would energize your word in our spirits, our souls, our minds, our hearts, that you would teach us what it is you want us to know. Make the application in every one of our situations and settings that we might be the men and women you want us to be. Thank you for children, the blessing that they are. Help us to raise them well in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't forget, but in three services, sometimes I think I've done or said something that I haven't done, so you understand that, right? Thanks. Train up a child. Number one, it's a command, and I just call it the take it to them command. Now, Take it to them. You could have this sort of warfare-like spirit to that. I'm going to take it to them. That's not what we mean. The word train, and you'd never get this from our English word train. The Hebrew word for train literally means to put a food morsel in their mouth. Just take a little bit of food morsel and put it in their mouth. In other words, what we're to do is we're to feed them until they're old enough to feed themselves. My grandson, Cade, is only a couple of, well, seven, eight weeks old. He can't feed himself. So the food is brought to him. We take the food to him. Tiff takes the food to him. Brian takes the food to him. Pretty soon, he'll be able to feed himself. Callie feeds herself now. It's hilarious. Only half of it gets in her mouth, and whatever she can fit in her hands In her tiny brain, she assumes it will also fit in my mouth. Not too long ago, we we took Callie, Darlene and I did, up to see my parents. They live north of Charleston, near Myrtle Beach. On the way home, Tiffany called and said, on your way back through Charleston, are you stopping at the Krispy Kreme? Well, of course I'm stopping at the Krispy Kreme. (laughs) You know where the Krispy Kreme is on Highway 17 in Charleston? It's one of the blessings God has on the city of Charleston. I said, of course. Okay, Dad, well, bring me home some donuts. Absolutely, I will. We stopped off in the Krispy Kreme. We walk in with Callie. She's this tall. The glass front display cabinet is at eye level for dozens of donuts. 
You could see it on her face as we walked in. She smells the Krispy Kreme donuts. She's looking at all of it. It, it was just heaven. We buy some donuts. Darlene excuses herself to go to the ladies' room. I said, Callie, come here. Sit Callie down at the table. Bought her a chocolate milk. Put the Krispy Kreme hat on her and broke out a chocolate glaze-covered donut. She'd never had one in her life. She has these terrible parents who believe that vegetables are good for you. <laughs> She's never had one. I said, Callie, it's pawpaw time. Let's go. I broke it down. I put that first bite in her mouth. Mmm, 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 mmm. Has the Krispy Kreme hat on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She had half of it down. My wife comes out. What are you doing? I said, it's too late now. It's in, man. She was loving it. That was at 4 o'clock. She wore the hat until she went to bed that night. I said, yeah, train up a child in the way that she'll go. She'll be eating Krispy Kreme the rest of her life. Every Friday, Callie and I share a bowl of she crab soup. That child loves she crab soup, loves it. So Callie, it's Friday. We're going to go get some soup. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Pretty soon she'll be able to order her own she crab soup and order her own donut and sit there with me and do it. But right now, as a youngster, you've got to help her. And what the Bible's telling us is this, mom and dad, is that we put the food of life in their mouth. We put the fruit of righteousness in their mouth. We take that morsel of the word of God and put it in their hearts. And it's our job to feed them the word of God and the things of God and the principles and the precepts of God until they can feed themselves. Does that make sense? That's what it means to train up. The word train can also be uh, translated start up. You start them in that way and they'll keep going in that way. And it's tough and it takes some things to do this. And very, very quickly on your outline, Got some things there, some A, B, C, D, and E on your outline. Let me give them to you quickly. What's it going to take to do this? It's going to take some sensitivity, first of all. Sensitivity. Understand their individual needs. You, you feed children basically the same, but if you have more than one child, you'll see one child likes one food, the other one doesn't like it. So you've got to make some well, you got to be sensitive to that. Letter B, discipline. The willingness to get involved in the affairs of life with your children, especially when they have done wrong. Don't walk away. Don't run away from it. Stay disciplined. I'm not talking about disciplining them. I'm talking about disciplining yourself to stay involved in their life. Letter C, flexibility. You're going to discover that what worked yesterday and last week and last month doesn't necessarily work today. And what works today is not going to work next year in raising your child. You've got to show some flexibility. Your methods have to change. Letter D is diligence. Staying with the stuff. Sticking with the non-negotiables of what you're teaching your children from the time they're born until the time you die. There are certain things I'm going to teach my children. They're non-negotiable. I'm going to be diligent in doing that. And letter E is time. It's just going to take some time. You hear a lot about quality time with children, and that's good. There better be some quantity time as well. Take it to them. Feed them the things of God. Letter B, or number two, sorry, is the would slash should direction. The first is a, is a command. Now he's talking about some direction here. Would or should. And the, the reason I say would or should is because of the words, train up a child in the way. The words in the way is one word in Hebrew. It's the word debar. And some people translate that to mean train up a, a child according to the way that he wants to go, the way that she wants to go, whatever their natural bent to go in a direction, then let them run free and go in that direction. And I'm telling you, I don't believe that that's what that word means. Because whenever you want to find out what a word means in the Bible, you look at the way the word's used everywhere else in the book. And everywhere else in the book of Proverbs, when si uh, Simon, Solomon uses the word debar in the way, it is always used 
as being defined as the way of the Lord. There's a way of wickedness and there's a way of the Lord. There is a way of, one of the Proverbs says, that seems right unto a man, but the ends are the ways of death. There's a way of death. There's a way of unrighteousness. There's a way of wickedness. But, and then he uses the word debar, there's the way of the Lord. And what this part is telling us is, train them up, feed them the things of God until they learn to feed themselves. And as you're feeding them righteousness and truth, you feed them and direct them in the ways of the Lord. You let them, now let, let them be an individual, yes, but tell them the ways of the Lord as you're raising them and as you're training them. So we should not understand the verse this way. It is not train up a child in the way he would go. It's train up a child in the way he should go. And the should is the way of the Lord. The should is biblical precepts and principles and truths. Take it to them as a command. The should direction. And then thirdly is the wet cement principle. Or depending upon where you're from, the wet cement principle. When he's old, he will not depart from it, or he will not turn from it. This is the part of the verse we have a problem with, especially if our children have gone a little bit sideways, or completely off the rails, and they're not following God. And the parent who has poured in the things of God to this child, and the child has gone another way, man, this, the, see, the problem's not with the verse, folks, the problem's with the child. The verse is true. And the problem with your child is, and I'm saying that facetiously, the problem with our children is they have a will. They're not robotic. We can't make them do anything. They have the ability to make their own choices. I think the verse is telling us this. God's given us the opportunity to plant the seeds in our children. And eventually, if you will maintain your hope in God and trust in Him and pray, the harvest will come. I read a commentator this week that used an unusual phrase. It says, if you will but train your children up in the way of the Lord, though later on they may drift from it as kids often do, at some point in life, that training, those prayers, that hope, that commitment will be like arms of love reaching across the years and the decades, bringing at last those children back to God. Don't give up. If you have a child today that's gone a little bit off the rails, they're away from God, and you've poured the, the word into them, and you've prayed, and you've done what you knew to do, and they still have gone that way, I just want to say a couple of things to you. Admit it hurts. Don't try to gloss over your feelings. It's tough. It hurts. It's scary. Don't give up hope. Our God is the God of hope. And as long as he exists, and as long as your child is still drawing breath, there is hope. And love your child no matter what they're doing or where they might be right now. And pray. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever stop praying. You know, it's Father's Day, and... I thought, you know, well, Mother's Day, we give away carnations, and quite frankly, for Father's Day, I thought, well, we can give dads donuts, cookies. Don't get too excited. You're not getting anything. <laughs> we could buy you some trinkets, and you'd either consume what we gave you today or you'd throw it away tomorrow. But I want to give you a gift that I, I think it's one of the best gifts I could give you. The best gifts I could give you, our, your church could give you. And we've got this insert in your worship folder, or it's online there. Seven things to pray for my children. And Dad, we could give you a donut on the way out today, and okay, great, fine, but I, I don't know anything I could give you better than this. Dad, if you're not praying for your son or your daughter, Mom, if you're not praying for them, who is? And here's seven ways you can pray, and they're all based on Scripture. But just pray. 
that Jesus will call them, no one will hinder them from coming, that they will respond in faith to Jesus' faithful, persistent call, that they will experience sanctification through the transforming work of the Holy Spirit and will increasingly desire to fulfill the greatest commandments, that they will not be unequally yoked in intimate relationships, especially marriage, that their thoughts would be pure, that their hearts will be stirred to give generously to the Lord's work, that when the time is right, they will go. Dad, I don't know what greater gift I could give you today than this guide to pray for your kid. And I don't know what greater gift you as a dad could give to your children than to pray for them like that. And you're praying God's word back to him, and there's power in that. So dad, be encouraged. Don't ever give up hope. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Keep holding on. You'll make it. You'll get through. And one day you'll hear that child say, I know I drove you nuts, but thank you. Sometimes all it takes is a, a word, a sentence from a daughter, a son. Thanks for being the greatest dad I could ever have. You can't buy that. There's no value you can ever place on that. And dad, the greatest thing you can do is pray. I'll tell you, if our children have fathers who pray like this for them, you're never going to have to worry about, are they going to turn out? Because God's word never comes back to him void. There's power in the scripture. And the Holy Spirit will work in that child's life even when you are miles and miles away. Happy Father's Day. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful today that when we are weak, you are strong. That when we fail as fathers, you succeed. That when we don't know what to do, you give us wisdom. That when we don't know how to pray, you pray for us. Lord, I pray for every dad hearing my voice right now. We want to thank you for our children, our sons and our daughters, our grandchildren. In some cases, our great-grandchildren. What a blessing. What a gift that you have given to us. And as we raise them and we parent them, and as they go through their phases and we go through that with them, would you give us the strength and the capacity that we need, the wisdom, the direction to know how to guide, to know when to be firm, know when to be tough, know when to be tender. But through it all, may we be loving. And may we live our lives through our actions and the words we say that our children know whatever else happens in my life, I know my dad loves me. I know my mom loves me. And nothing can ever change that. And that's simply a reflection of your love to us. Thank you that you are our heavenly father. That we always have you to run to, to turn to, to look to for advice and counsel and wisdom and direction. We thank you and we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen.
dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne